Hi. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. Am I still employable? Navigating your job from pandemic to endemic. This webinar is part of the Law Awareness Weeks at CDC 2021, which is a collaboration between the Law Society Pro Bono Services Office, the five Community Development Councils, CDCs, the National University of Singapore Faculty of Law, the Singapore University of Social Sciences School of Law, Singapore Management University School of Law, and the Corporate Council Association Pro Bono Chapter, and supported by the People's Association. My name is Lian Chen. I'm your moderator for today. But before we begin, let's uh, have some housekeeping matters um, dealt with. Please feel free to ask any questions uh, at any time during the webinar using the Q&A icon located at the bottom of your Zoom window. We'll do our best to address your questions during or at the end of the talk. There is also a QR code feature in the slides for you to scan to access the handouts made available for this webinar. There's also a link that will be sent to you in a follow-up email uh, tomorrow after the end of this uh, webinar this evening. Please note that the discussion, as well as the materials provided to you during this webinar is not meant to substitute or constitute professional legal advice. If you have specific legal queries, you should consult a lawyer um, to address your concerns. And with that, uh, let me introduce our speakers for today. They are Mr. Patrick Tay, as well as Ms. To Wei Yi. Patrick is the Assistant Secretary General of NTUC, also the Director of NTUC's Legal Services and Strategy Division. Concurrently, he is an elected MP and member of the NTUC Central Committee. He chairs the Government Parliamentary Committee, GPC, for Education, and is a member of the GPC for Law and Home Affairs. Patrick has been representing the labor movement in all the tripartite work groups to review and update employment and industrial relations legislation. Wei is a partner in the litigation and dispute management practice group of Harry Elias Partnership. Her main areas of expertise are in the commercial litigation arena involving issues of contract, director's duties, shareholders disputes, banking law, negligence, defamation, employment, breach of trust, and collective sales matters. Wei is actively involved in the Law Society of Singapore as a member of the Law Awareness Committee and as a volunteer with the Criminal Legal Aid Scheme. Wei also tutors for the preparatory co course leading to the Part B of the Singapore Bar Examinations, which is conducted by the Singapore Institute of Legal Education. Uh, and with that, thank you, Wei and Patrick, for joining us today. Hi. Thank you, Lisha, and good evening to everybody. Yep, good evening to all too. Okay, so before we begin, and just to give the attendees a sense of what to expect, maybe I set out an overview of what we'll be discussing uh, for today's webinar. Uh, basically, we have uh, set out three scenarios relating to employees at three different stages of their lives. And then I will invite the panelists to provide their insights on how these employees can protect their rights, uh, strengthen their, their rights, and at the same time, maintain their employability as they navigate uh, from this situation of the pandemic to the endemic. Uh, the three categories of employees we have uh, sort of looked at would be the fresh graduates, the mid-career employees, as well as the experienced and the older employees. Uh, during this webinar, we'll also be sharing some of the resources available for the vulnerable workers, uh, and also uh, the resources that we'll be touching on during this webinar. Lastly, we'll conclude the webinar with a Q&A session uh, to address the queries that have been put forth by our attendees today, if we've not already answered them during the course of the webinar. So that's how the structure of tonight's uh, webinar would be. Okay, so Wei and Patrick, let's move into the webinar. All right, let's start with an easy scenario so that we can ease everyone into this. All right, uh, so we're looking at a fresh graduate here, which is John. John is a graduate uh, of an Institute of Higher Learning, IHL. It has been challenging for him to find a job in recent times because of the COVID-19 situation. Uh, John is wondering whether he should take on a role on a contract basis uh, in a company of the same industry he wishes to work in uh, and then search for other full-time jobs in the meantime, right? Uh, let's do the easy part first, Wei. Um, mm. You know, when an individual like, a, like John here who's a fresh graduate and he's looking at potential employment, it has been made an offer what are some of the things that he should look out for, legally speaking? Um, okay, so when he's made an offer, I think um, 
the first thing he needs to make sure is that, um, you know, it is not just an offer that, you know, verbal offer, oh, you know, I'd like to offer you a job at this position. I think he should ensure that uh, there is a contract that is has been given to him, that he has sight of what are the principal terms of his employment. Um, and it should be in writing uh, in and offered to him by his employer, uh, because these are the terms that will bind him in the course of uh, this contract um, that he has with the employer. Uh, the one thing he needs to look out for, especially in this scenario, is that uh, he needs to understand whether he is uh, taking on a contract of service or a contract for service. So meaning whether he is an employee uh, to this employer or is he taking on the role as an independent contractor? Because there are some implications in terms of um, CPF and also his uh, rights and his obligations under the Employment Act. Um, now, I wanted to highlight one thing, particularly in this scenario, is that even if you are um, on a short-term contract, it, it is possible that you are still an employee, you know, just because it's a one-year contract or maybe even a six-month contract. It does not mean that you cannot be an employee of this company. Um, now, certain principal terms of the employment, I think what is, you know, at the forefront of his consideration are probably things like salary, his work hours, his rest days. Um, but I think there are also a few other items that I think he should look out for uh, because these are the things that we commonly see come into dispute in the course of the, the work relationship. So things like um, uh, his leave entitlement, for example. Um, he needs to understand what is his entitlement. Um, and how he goes about taking the leave. Uh, also, the scope of his work, uh, is he susceptible to redeployment by the employer uh, if the need arises? Because you know, if that is the case, he may well end up doing something very different from what he expected to have been doing in the first place. And I think the last thing and most commonly that we see, uh, which comes into, into dispute, uh, is at the termination of the employment. So he needs to understand based on the contract, uh, how does he go about terminating uh, this contract with the employer? Um, it may be a premature termination. It may be you know, midway through the one year um, period that he expected to work. Perhaps you know, there has been a mismatch of expectations. So he needs to understand um, you know, what is his notice period uh, that he needs to notify the employer that he is terminating his contract. And uh, similarly, uh, what are the circum circumstances under which his employer can terminate uh, this contract. Um, so yeah, I think this would be the main um, items. Oh, maybe one more item to look out for is that if he works in a large organization, he may also want to see if there are any employee handbooks or any policies that the company circulates that are applicable to all um, its staff. And so he or she may want to familiarize himself or herself uh, with this document. Mm. I think it's very important. So there are a few things that he should look at, salary, scope of work, uh, termination rights, leave entitlement, um, as well as notice period under the termination. Especially important for John, I think, if he's transitioning yes. part-time to a full-time, he needs to know That's how right. much this to give. That's um, right, yeah. Yeah, so, so Patrick, from a, from a legal, or rather from a labour <laughs> movement kind of uh, perspective, um, what are some of the practical things that you think John should look out for if he's transiting from, um, uh, you know, part-time employment to full-time jobs? Is this something that is uh, advisable, uh, you know? Yeah, uh, thanks, Liangshan, and also uh, thanks, Wei Yi, for sharing some of the, you know, fundamental principles of employment law and contract. Uh, particularly, as, as I just want to reiterate what uh, Wei Yi shared earlier, very, very important. Uh, yes, there may be a verbal contract employment, but ideally should have it in writing. And uh, I think clarity is very important. And please, please, uh, I have some practical tips for everyone out there looking for your first job or, you know, it could be in the next job. Uh, please read your employment contract. Uh, some may be just a one pager, two pager. Some may be 20, 30 pages. So, but whatever it is you're signing on dotted line, please read front to back uh, every single word because uh, that may come back to haunt you uh, in time to come. So, so that's the very first thing I would advise anyone who is entering into an employment contract. Uh, like what we mentioned, uh, of course, uh, there's a, a contract role, i.e. maybe six months to a year. Uh, but uh, And of course, there's a full-time role or a contract of service, uh, which may exist in a contract arrangement as well. 
but also there's an independent contractor or what we shared earlier as contract for services, which are uh, increasingly happening, what we call the gig workers or we call it contingent workers, depending on yeah. the different terms they're being used. So, so do, do read your employment contract carefully, but that will uh, uh, outline whether you know, it's a contract of service or called for service. However, however, uh, as you are aware, uh, the government has rolled out a series of various apprenticeships, traineeships um, that has happened, uh, have been rolled out in the last uh, one year or so, particularly as sort of uh, a bridge or to help many of those who are looking for uh, work, um, particularly those fresh out of school and also those in mid-career. Uh, and they call them the SG United Traineeships Program or SG United Skills Program. So some of these programs are actually not employment contracts. Uh, but actually sort of like an a, a apprenticeship or traineeship for a period of time. Could be as short as three months, could be as long as nine months. And uh, there's a stipend, there's an allowance. And uh, take, take particular note, uh, I think uh, I've been speaking about this uh, with uh, the various agencies uh, and of course openly as well, um, that it's important to, to, uh, to read the terms of uh, this traineeship um, and know its limitations. Again, it is one of those programs to help uh, our fresh school leavers in particular to segue to at least a start uh, to pick some work experience. And of, of course, for them to see whether they like their particular sector, industry or company or organization. And for the organization and company to size them up as well, to see whether they are suitable for the organization and offer them perhaps even full-time permanent position at the end of the traineeship. So that's one uh, you need to take particular uh, note of. Uh, and 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 don't don't be too worried. Don't be too worried. I think uh, we have uh, seen many uh, first time new entrants in the workforce being worried about. You know, what are the key employment terms that I need to look out for? You know, like what we shared earlier. Uh, some of the key principles: hours of work, whether you're wearing uniform or not, how you terminate, how you claim leave, how you, you know, have what kind of rest days, etc. Uh, there's actually a tripartite standards uh, on key employment terms. Uh, we have we have kindly uh, put together a, a nice Google Doc. Uh, document uh, thanks to the, the PBSO staff team for, for putting it up. Early on, you saw a QR code. Uh, later on, we'll flash it as well and we'll put the links uh, into this chat as well so that you can uh, access this plethora of materials. And uh, this tripartite uh, standards on key employment terms actually outline some of the key employment terms which uh, need to be you know shared or put in writing uh, for an employer to an employee. So that's one starting point. The other uh, resource you can uh, make you full use of Thanks to our, this, uh, this Law Works partnership between NTUC and the Law Society Pro Bono Services Office is this uh, pocket series called uh, My First Job. Uh, so that's also available. We are putting it out uh, on the, the list of resources you, you can access. And that again, sets out a nice checklist as well as the key things to look out for. Uh, some of the things that Wei Yi and myself just shared are, are in there. And finally, for some of you who are employers out there, who are trying to you know, scratch your head and you know, how do I write an employment contract? What do I look out for? And you, know, you could be a startup or even a micro SME trying to start building a business. Not to worry, not to fret. Uh, the MOM, besides the two resources earlier, my first job and the tripartite standards on key employment terms, is also the MOM website, mom.gov.sg, where you can access sample templates on employment contracts, best practices, very, very basic ones, which you can uh, cut and paste for your use. Yes, actually the resources will all be shared with the attendees. Um, just to summarize, I think it's important one to have everything in writing and to read through the, the, the written document. Uh, I think uh, when, I, when the attendees see the key employment terms on the TAFET template, you will realize that it's actually not a lot of things. Actually, the template is about two pages long. It sets up most of the important things that the, the, the first um, job uh, seekers should be looking at and also serves as a timely reminder for the employers as well, like what Patrick mentioned. Um, yeah, and also I think what Patrick mentioned was very important because uh, it's important to know what kind of role you're in. If you're a trainee, if you're a contract staff, freelancer, gig worker, or a permanent staff but on a contract basis, uh, all these are important because they affect your rights as well. Um, I, I think the MOM website is a very great resource. Sometimes, even as a lawyer, I look into the MOM website and it, it sets up quite clearly what are the rights there as well. Um, yeah, so that's just to summarize. Um, we move on to the next year because I think the next year is actually where the bulk of our attendees are. Um, this is the mid-career um, uh, workers, okay? Because with the pandemic, um, I have heard of many companies adjusting salary, putting 
employees on flexible wage systems uh, or even adjusting their employment benefits without their consent. And that, that during actually in, in the last year or so, that has been some of the bulk of my employment queries that have been coming to me. Uh, first thing first, Wei, is it legal for the company to just um, adjust the salary or adjust the benefits of the employees? Okay, certainly not um, without the employee's consent. Okay, regardless of what sort of contract you are under, uh, more likely than not, it would have been writing the salary that you're entitled to. Now, of course, I mean, in the current situation, uh, you know, myself in the course of my work, many um, employers have also um, inquired about this issue. And um, I think in a way, it's a matter of survival for them to, to adjust the wages. But the important thing uh, is that they get the consent uh, of the employee. So um, usually how it takes place is that the employer will probably uh, propose to the employee that, look, you know, I'm going to have to implement um, either a wage cut or some kind of a flexible wage arrangement. And if you consent, then please also do sign um, to acknowledge your consent. So I think this would be the most proper way of, of doing it to avoid any um, issues on, or disputes on this later on. Um, so yes, for all the employees out there, um, your consent needs to be sought. Um, then the question, I think the question that comes is that, you know, what if, what if you don't agree uh, to this uh, change in the wages? Um, I think there are some, there's some recourse for employees to approach the employment, uh, employment claims tribunal uh, to mediate uh, the dispute. Um, I think the harsh reality is also that if at the end of the day, the employee and the employee cannot reach an agreement as to the wages, then it would actually end up in the very drastic consequence of uh, the employment contract terminating. I mean, as the employee, if you really cannot accept um, this wage cut, or actually for that matter, um, uh, a drastic and radically different redeployment, um, then perhaps the only consequence, the only option available would be actually to just terminate the employment uh, with notice. But I mean, of course, in the current climate, you know, I think employees and employees all hope that we don't have to come to that. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think it is important because uh, we need to be practical <laughs> in the approach, right? Yes. Uh, yeah. And like what you mentioned, uh, it is also helping the employers survive <laughs> in such a terrible uh, climate as well. Yes. I mean, certain industries in particular, you see that, you know, uh, employers implementing change after change because they're just trying to to make it through this period. So, but that being said, we also understand from an employee's point of view, you know, there are certain, uh, you know, requirements in terms of the remuneration for, for, for themselves and the family. So, yeah, so that's, that is the situation. Yeah. Um, Patrick, I, I actually have heard of something called the flexible wage payment system. Uh, I and I think uh, it has come out in the, some of the collaterals out there when we were trying to um, deal with the COVID-19 situation as well. Yes. Uh, can you share a little bit about that? Yes, uh, that's right, John. And uh, I, I can't agree more with the both of you earlier. When you talk about, you know, the, the, the key thing is to make sure your company or your employer stays as a going concern and survives. I think that's critical uh, in, in any circumstances. Um, uh, but like I said, uh, coming from the labor movement or NTUC, I can't help but say, you know, um, in, in such cases, particularly besides the employment contract, in most of our unionized companies, we have something called the collective agreement, where some of these issues come up. Uh, what, when can you, uh, you know, cut wages? When can you activate the flexible wage system, etc.? So actually, it's, it's quite um, clearly outlined. So therefore, um, that, that's why we want to, uh, you know, get more workers uh, being union members, including professionals, managers, executives, and and have the collective agreement so that uh, it provides some clarity, particularly when, when the company needs to exercise uh, or touch any of the fle uh, flexible wage component. And uh, I mean, before I, I articulate more on the, the flexible wage system, essentially the flexible wage system, uh, it's uh, has been around for, for, I would say at least two decades. Yeah, it's something mm. practiced not just in Singapore, but in uh, many other different countries, including like countries like Japan. Uh, in, 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 in short, uh, if you look at the total uh, wage bill or monthly salary, uh, what a flexible wage system does is that uh, out of this 100% of the, your monthly salary, 
or should I say annual component or annual uh, package, 70% goes to the basic, yeah? Uh, 20% goes to a annual variable component and 10% goes to a monthly variable component. Again, this is a, not a hard and fast rule. This is generally for uh, the general group of workers. However, if you move up a hierarchy, uh, the chances are that your basic, the 70% basic will be much lower and the higher variable component uh, is instituted. So that's how flexible work system uh, goes in. You may be asking me why sometimes we refer to that uh, in many of our advisories, guidelines, etc. Um, for a start, if, if the company is going to a, a, a massive uh, uh, financial issue, yeah, in, in the brink of a disaster or maybe going down south, um, and, and if there's uh, a flexible wage system implemented in the company, uh, what traditionally in a unionized company we do is that the union will negotiate the, the employer uh, to try to use various uh, cost-cutting measures because our rules of engagement is that we want to cut costs to save jobs, not cut jobs to save costs. So I think the key principle is how, where can we find ways to cut costs? For example, like, you know, a yard or factory shut down, a, a compulsory no pay leave, a shorter work week, uh, maybe training, going for training, etc. So we try to use various mechanisms to help the company tight through the difficult period. Just like last year, including this year, where we had a jobs credit scheme and a job support scheme as well, a uh, job support scheme to, to help companies uh, uh, alleviate their pains particularly with um, the, all the various heightened measures and phases. So, so that's why example, uh, it, it, back to the example uh, where, where there's a need to, both the union and employer will discuss to see whether uh, they need to touch. If all else um, you know, come, uh, measures have been undertaken and they have to cut wages, they use a the monthly variable component to adjust. Um, so there's 10% of it to adjust. So that's how the flexible wage system goes. But I thought uh, good to mention that um, in light of what's happening, the pandemic, and now we are moving on to endemic, uh, I think two important uh, tripartite instruments we need to look at. Uh, in the last year, if you, if, in fact, the past 18 months, if you realize there were a lot of tripartite advisories, I think uh, we e or even uh, we're trying to be busy with uh, all these advisories coming hard and fast at you. Yeah. Uh, you know, how, when can you uh, execute a wage card? When can you uh, execute a retrenchment? Uh, how much to pay and what to pay, etc. Uh, are all in these tripartite advisories, which uh, the tripartite partners, i.e. the Ministry of Manpower, National Trades Union Congress, and Singapore National Employers Federation have uh, come up with to guide companies and businesses, and of course, employees and workers. So that's, uh, we, have, we have put some of these in the, in the collaterals for you, to, because it's still in force and uh, still relevant. Uh, the other piece of document uh, is the National Wages Council guidelines. This is an annual document, it first started in 1972, and it's still being issued annually. In fact, just last week, we issued this year's National Wages Council Guidelines. So it's fresh off the oven. Uh, you can Google it. You can get it as a copy of it. Uh, it articulates what moving forward uh, post from November onwards to next year, what, what uh, companies who are maybe going down south, those companies who are doing fairly okay and those companies who are doing very well, what they should or should not do um, in, 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 in managing wages and in restoring wages and in increasing wages and and in, in executing some of these cost-cutting measures. That's, that's quite useful to know. I think what I hear is at the end of the day, uh, we're all trying to find ways, like what Patrick said, right? We are trying to save jobs rather than to cut jobs to save costs. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think at the end of the day, that's very, very important because um, having a job is better than not having one, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay, let's, let's talk about the scenario. I've prepared a scenario where we are talking about this um, mid-career employee who is trying to um, pivot because that's another big issue that has been coming to us hmm. uh, as lawyers where, you know, the employee is trying to um, find diffi diffi different ways actually to survive in such difficult times. So in, in this scenario, Kenneth is a, a, in his mid-40s. He, he has been told that um, his management is likely to reduce his job scope and remuneration. He is considering pivoting to a different industry and taking out a different role um, as he has been having difficulties finding a position that's similar to what his remuneration is now as well as his role. Um, maybe let's start with the easy one. Patrick, when we're thinking about pivoting, what, what would be some of the practical advice you would share with those who are thinking about pivoting now? Yes, uh, I, I think the, we, we are still not out of the woods. I think uh, unemployment rates have uh, looked a bit better. The latest one being released uh, just a couple of weeks ago and, and 
really we are we are we are still not out of the woods yet. I think things move, moving forward are still looking very uncertain and uneven as well. I know some industries are doing fairly well and they are bouncing back. Uh, some industries well, uh, fairly staying afloat, uh, but there are still industries deeply impacted and still impacted. So I think it's uneven and uncertain. So it's very important uh, for all of us, uh, all workers, particularly the matured ones, because uh, why, why are we particularly concerned about matured professionals, managers, and executives, particularly those in between the ages of 40 to 60? The reason why we are particularly worried, and recently we, we, we launched a report uh, called the NTUC SNAP PME Task Force Report, where we highlighted some of the anxieties, fears, and, and some of the uh, results and findings are, 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 you know, can, can be quite shocking to many of you. They realize where are the, the pain points and fears. Because I think there are two things that uh, many of those in the mid-career, 40s, 60s, are worried about. Firstly, job security. Secondly, employability. So I think very, very important to address these two factors. Very, very important. So therefore, uh, therefore uh, if, if I may say, uh, particularly even before COVID-19, I think uh, many companies are looking at industry transformation, reorganizing, re-strategizing, including digitalizing. But I think what has happened in the last 18 months has accelerated, propelled exponentially many of these uh, digitalization efforts. Uh, frankly, if you are not already digitalized, you'll probably be uh, facing a, quite a crisis. So as you can see, many companies, be it the large uh, multinationals, different sectors, different industries, even micro SME startups, uh, SMEs, Everyone, uh, even the retailers, uh, you can even see e-commerce is getting very, very big. And therefore, uh, what it also means is many of the traditional jobs uh, may, 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 yeah, they may, some may disappear, but some may also be transformed and, uh, and, and uh, redesigned. And, uh, and you will see uh, a different kind of skill requirement for many of the jobs and particularly the new opportunities. So... Uh, even before COVID-19, you talk about the half-life of skills is actually at like five years. So therefore, very, very important uh, as uh, a message out there to all our, our uh, mid-career workers, i.e. 40 to 60, I think look out for openings. I know some of you may be looking out for openings. Consider them. Yeah, uh, you, 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 It's going to be quite difficult to get a perfect one uh, where it marries entirely of your skills. But I mean, explore the various opportunities. Some may be in adjacent sectors, which uh, you used to be in or are in, uh, or it may be in new sectors. I think they are, we, are, we are fortunate in Singapore, we have quite a number of support schemes from the professional conversion programs to the SG United Skills program and the various programs and support. I think there's no shortage of funding for skills upgrading and training, including skills future credit, even if, if any of us want to pick up some of these skills. I mean, I just went for... Uh, one not too long ago, uh, last year and this year. And, and really, I think there's a need for us to pick up the necessary skills. And uh, pivoting, uh, let me tell you, I mean, I went for a few of these skills future programs. It's not easy. Eh? It's not easy. Eh? It's not, uh, you can imagine I'm, I'm 50, so I'm right smack 40 to 60, eh? right in the middle. So they're super vulnerable. So I, I can imagine, you know, I, even myself, um, going for a three-day course, it, it's not easy. You really pick up uh, new knowledge, new skills. It's not easy. But I think uh, let's have a positive mindset and, and uh, you know, pick up the skill, pick up the experience, uh, learn the new knowledge and see whether you, are, you know, have an appetite or, or have the competency to do it for a long haul in a permanent basis. So I think very important. Keep an open mind, I think, at the end of the day. I don't think it's easy for me as well. <laughs> I'm, very, I'm very curious. Patrick, what are you pivoting to? <laughs> yes, I, I, I actually did... did You're uh, a baker? No, no, no. Uh, uh, not yet, not yet. I know some of my friends and colleagues uh, are doing that. I, I, I did because, uh, I mean, I've been working quite closely in the financial sector. I've been hearing growth sector in the financial sector, particularly in the fintech space. Mm. This week, we are in the yeah. thick of, uh, next week, we are in the thick of the fintech festival. So I actually mm -hmm. went for a fintech foundation program uh, about two years ago okay. and, uh, and, and pick up some of the necessary skills. I, it was an eye-opener for me. I mean, uh, I, I didn't know uh, it was uh, such a big spectrum of knowledge, you know, uh, knowing about blockchain, crypto, design mm. thinking and, and stuff like that. So it was quite an eye-opener. And, and uh, just earlier this year, I, I took another program, uh, you know, also in the financial sector on advising family officers. And, and I, I tell you, it's, uh, you know, I've not been taking exams for a long while. It was <laughs> quite frightening uh, when they told me that you, you don't get at least 70%, you're going to fail the exams. So uh, fortunately, I, I barely scraped and passed. So yeah, 
Trust me, it wasn't easy. So I can empathize with many of you who are picking up new skills. So I think it's, it's, it's both a combination, right, in terms of new skills, but also new knowledge, so that you're kept current uh, in terms of the knowledge for the industry or whether for the new industry that you're pivoting to. Um, I, I always have this anecdote where I have uh, an employee who came to me and she said, oh, you know, when I was looking for jobs, right, Nowadays, even if you use Telegram, you might be able to find jobs uh, offers through, through Telegram groups. And I say, oh, I'm not even on Telegram. Uh, and that's that's how I'm trying to learn and be, be kept up to date with the technological uh, advances. So, um, yeah. But there are, no, there are no shortage of all these uh, virtual career fairs. In fact, as we are talking now, I mean, in my constituency today, we just had a uh, career fair uh, mm -hmm. right, right in the heart of um, somewhere in the West, Pioneer. And uh, I, I'm glad to share that uh, we have, despite the weather today, we have all more than 800 people turning up. Mm, yeah, wow. uh, it, it shows how how pressing, or well, it's a, it's a reflection of the job market as well. And uh, it continues to tomorrow. Mm. So if you want to come by tomorrow, you can uh, feel free to drop by, and uh, and and it, you know you can do it virtually as well. So I think there's quite a lot of employers out there. So I mean the the positive thing is that there are employers out there, uh, looking for uh, potential hires. Uh, there are lots of them, you know, uh, in fact, uh, more than 100 of them. Uh, but at the same time, also, they also require you to have some skills uh, and, and knowledge. And I think at the end of the day, it's a positive attitude and a mindset. I think uh, in increasingly, I'm seeing employers wanting to take workers. They can't get a perfect fit because maybe some new skills are required. I think they're willing to train, support. But at the end of the day, I think the, the key is uh, they want to see uh, the job seeker's attitude. And whether he has a growth mindset, whether he's positive, enthusiastic, and very keen to learn. I think that's these are qualities which uh, increasingly I'm seeing in employers who I, uh, whom I interact quite a lot with. Okay. Because that was the question I was going to ask Wei as an employer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was hoping to ask Wei actually, and, 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 and given that she's a partner of a law firm and an employer as well, Actually, in, in what are some of the things that she'll be looking at when she's looking at a, a mid-career uh, candidate, for example, coming into the law firm? Well, I think just like what Patrick said, I think it's very it's very difficult um, and perhaps perhaps unrealistic uh, to some extent uh, to expect to get a perfect fit. So um, I will say that. Um, the candidate needs to possess some basic skills. Okay, like say, take for example, um, someone would like to join us as uh, administrative staff, maybe a secretary, a legal secretary. Now for legal work, there are a lot of, there are certain systems um, that we utilize with the courts, for example, in the litigation side. Now these are obviously very specialized and you will need a bit of time to get used to, to that. Uh, but, you know, a person who has, basic you know word processing skills for example she can handle you know day-to-day -day, uh, what a secretary a legal secretary might be expected to do send out letters send out emails now as to that aspect which is very specialized in the industry which is you know um, being able to to um what we call e-file you know certain things which are specific to the legal industry um we expect in fact we expect that this person who comes in um, there will be this period of time where the person will need to get trained up. So um, in that sense, uh, at least speaking for myself, and I think also for many employers, um, uh, they are fairly realistic and they do expect that, that bit of training time. But again, as Patrick said, the attitude, you know, if somebody who, who's very keen to pick up, who's very keen to learn from their colleagues, from their peers, because that's usually what happens, you know, in, in, in most companies, right? Your, your colleagues are the one. Uh, who helps you out, who mentors you. So, I mean, with that correct attitude, which is what we look out for, of course, in, in an interview, um, you know, I think we are, we are open to hiring uh, those, for example, who have never worked in the legal industry, you know, but they possess that basic set of skills. But again, then I think in order for it to be a good enough match um, in terms of expectations on both sides, I think this, this candidate does need to possess that basic set of skills, which is where maybe as Patrick said, you know, some of these um, skills uh, upgrading or um, causes, I think it would really, really help. Yeah, and also I think these causes help you to stay current, you know, not just 
um, not just uh, you know the old set of skills that you may have from like a decade ago. I think you have to stay current. And so I think it is something that the employers uh, will also look out for. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I always share this story, which I shared with the panelists when we had a discussion previously about how, uh, yes. I, yeah, I have an event planner from RWS, but because RWS, you know, had, had been uh, sort of affected because of the COVID situation, tourism isn't going strong. And she came to join my firm as a secretary. And because she was an event planner, she was very able to handle high stress environment in a law firm, right? Because running an event is also equally high, stressful for her. I thought that was quite interesting because like, like what Patrick and Wei has said, if you have the right mindset, if you have the right skills, actually some of the field skills are transferable and you wouldn't even expect it, right? Like who mm. would expect being able to deal with stress and organize things? be a useful skill to use in a highly stressful environment like a law firm, which also requires quite a bit of planning and dealing with the stress as well. So, so, so that, that I always share because I, th I thought it was quite an interesting um, success story. <laughs> yeah, it's it's going to be a great testimony and uh, I, 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 I will definitely be in touch with you, Liang Shen, to share this uh, <laughs> great testimony on you know, mature PMEs being able to segue into uh, opportunities in other sectors because uh, some of you who are mature PMEs who are, who are in, that, in that age range who are actually or even all uh, who are looking for work uh, in, in case you're not aware there's something called a jobs growth incentive today uh, where, where government actually provides some form of subvention uh, for a certain percentage of uh, uh, a new hire's uh, salary uh, to the tune of six months to a year so I, I really appeal to uh, all employers out there to maximize uh, this job growth incentive while it's still available till early next year. And uh, I've actually lobbied for it to continue on a permanent basis uh, as mm -hmm. part of the PME task force report to encourage employers to, to give a shot uh, uh, you know, and, and some support and well, in a way an encouragement and to, to give uh, potential job seekers a, a, a try in that, uh, in that position. Uh, and also allow employers to have an opportunity to size up the employee or you know while he's on this scheme to see whether uh, in the first year whether he or she really is up to it has the right attitude right mindset and is able to uh, you know to hold up to the job at the same time also for the employee i thought it was is 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 great uh, many of them who have benefited from previously called a career support program now called a job scope incentive uh, have have shared very positive testimonies that you know um, well both both ways lah one are that, you know, uh, having gone into this sector, they realize, oh, this is really not the sector I want to go get into and, and be in for the longer term. And there are also those who are uh, at the onset, you know, oh, uh, this sector, uh, maybe maybe not, uh, but I, okay, uh, never mind. We just give it a shot. Maybe let's see how it goes. And uh, there you go, you know, they are still in the job after many, many years. So I, I, I think uh, such incentives and schemes and programs are, are a great boon to, to companies and of course to job seekers. So, so if you are mature PME, uh, mid-career PME and looking out for work, remember there's this JGI, remember these three abbreviations or acronyms, JGI. And when you go for your uh, you know, job interview, tell your prospective employer, you can tap on the JGI and then you can uh, size me up for one year. So that was what I wanted to say. It's actually not just information for the employers, but for the employees as well. When you go into interviews, then they can... You know, talk to yes. the employers about it because um, mm. even even with some of my trainees who are coming into a law firm, they also say, "Hey, have you thought of the SG United traineeships?" Mm, that's I, right. Yeah, so it actually helps the employer because it will ease the financial uh, burden and the cost as well with the help of this uh, support scheme. Yes, that's right. Yeah, mm. I I thought that pivoting um actually is not that new or different anymore, and we are hearing more and more stories of people pivoting. That's right. Um, and, and even for uh, one, one example that comes to my mind is the SUSS, where uh, the third law school is uh, also getting a lot of mid-career people uh, and then training them to be lawyers. And some of them have you know, social science backgrounds, sociology, psychology mm -hmm. uh, backgrounds, which are useful. Very useful. The skills uh, mm -hmm. for lawyering as well. So I, I just thought, you know, the idea of pivoting, the idea of transferable skills, not new anymore. Um, yeah. And I just think that it's uh, important for the employees to have that mindset. Like. Yeah. And, and also uh, a message out to employers out there as, as uh, you know, reiterated earlier, uh, gone are the days where you can find a plug and play person, you know, 100% uh, mm -hmm. perfect fit. 
uh, it, it's going to be difficult because uh, skills are getting obsolete so fast. The workplace is being transformed by the minute uh, and new, new softwares are coming up. So there's no way you're going to get a perfect fit. Uh, if you can get more or less a, a person with the right attitude and a keen eye to detail and willing to work hard and pick up the skills and able to work in your team, I think the key is uh, tap on the various schemes. I think there are generous plethora of schemes to send your staff for training to pick up the necessary skills. Uh, practically every sector has a, a skills framework and, and all, most of the programs, especially the certifiable ones, are heavily supported. Even if they're not supported, uh, there, there are also uh, various subvention to help companies to pick up uh, digitalization skills. For example, like IMDA gives a lot of support to SMEs if they are going digital. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you can't tap on the skills training uh, funding, they can also help as uh, you know as companies digitalize in that digital uh, embracing journey. Yes. Okay. So uh, for the attendees, just a gentle reminder: do keep your questions coming in. We will try to address them uh, as and when we can during the the webinar. Um, we have talked quite a bit about the mid career uh, professionals. I thought it is now time for us to move into what I call the graying population. <laughs> um, the, the experienced uh, employees who are working into their golden years. I think um, more and more we hear stories of uh, people in uh, situations like this. Um, I will also ask Patrick later about the uh, changes to the retirement age because that was just announced in uh, Parliament, I think, this week. Um, so, but let's start, let's start the easy one first. <laughs> I thought it would be easier if we do the easier one first. Um, let's look at the scenario. This is a case regarding Leonard, 61 years old, uh, just before the retirement age, unsure about his work arrangement with employer working forward, and is wondering whether to discuss retirement uh, payments with his employer. Um, Wei, maybe from a legal point of view, insofar as retirement payments are concerned, uh, are they compulsory for the senior workers who have found themselves uh, let go by their employers? Um, okay, so the law mandates certain options. Um, so, of course, uh, I think ideally, you know, um, I think there is encouragement to re-employ uh, these older workers who have reached um, the, you know, the so-called retirement age. Um, but at the end of the day, if uh, they are unable to uh, come to an arrangement that's mutually acceptable to both parties, uh, then um, instead there could be a payment out to uh, these older workers. Um, so in terms of the quantum, it is not uh, fixed, and um, but it is supposed to be uh, around 3.5 months of the salary or something in the range of between 5,500 to about 13,000. Uh, so yeah, so um, this is what is mandated. And, uh, but of course, I think at the end of the day for the employers out there, I think the objective really is, uh, if possible, to try to re-employ the older workers. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So Patrick, my, my question now about the re Retirement yeah. and Re-Employment Act. <laughs> this yeah. was in Parliament this week. Yeah, really, um, this is really fresh from the oven. Yeah, we just passed the, the changes to the uh, you know, Retirement and Reemployment Act on Tuesday. So just uh, three days ago, uh, we in Parliament, we had long discussions and many speakers talking about this and the various aspects. Um, but I think essentially what this uh, deck of amendments uh, does is uh, it gives effect to the recommendations of the tripartite work group or committee on older workers. I think one of the key uh, things that... Uh, that the, the Tropolite Work Group recommended was the raising of the retirement age. Currently, it's at 62. So with this passing of the law, uh, on, or should I say the new act, uh, it, it will raise the retirement age from 62 to 63 come uh, July next year. Uh, so July next year, it will take effect. So the retirement age is no longer 62, it's 63. So that's one. Second uh, is the re-employment age. Currently, when, uh, in fact, this has been introduced quite a number of years back. Uh, the, the, that's why... Uh, previously called the Retirement Age Act has been transformed or should I say repealed and then now this new Retirement and Reemployment Act. Uh, so now besides retirement, uh, is what we alluded to earlier, after 62 currently, currently, 
uh, you 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 uh, employers are obliged to to continue to re-employ uh, their workers uh, uh, who are fit and able to and where their positions uh, to six, the age of 67 years old, i.e. five more years of re-employment. Uh, in the whole world, there are actually uh, only two countries that does this. Uh, is Japan and Singapore. Uh, we, we, we did, we picked, I believe, quite a lot from the, the Japanese in coming up with this re-employment uh, act and law and uh, this re-employment provision. So it's basically to, in a way, allow those who are keen and able and want to continue to work to be able to do so. I think increasingly, uh, people are, are living longer. Our life expectancy is now in the mid-80s and you'll, you'll be raised further, much, much more higher in years to come. Uh, likewise, also, uh, many of us, although uh, in the 40s, 50s, or even 60s, may still have other obligations, financial obligations, because we have aging parents and we have uh, children, some maybe even young children, uh, and various obligations. Therefore, uh, this opportunity to continue to be re-employed allows uh, workers who have reached the retirement age to consider whether to continue uh, being re-employed and continue to be actively engaged in the workforce. I think many people are starting to do that because they want to keep their mind active. It could be a smaller job, it could be a part-time job, but still continue to be actively engaged in the workforce. I think uh, we have done quite a great job in this in the last decade. And, and I know uh, uh, many, many workers today uh, want to be able to have the opportunity to continue. So come July 2022, a uh, few things. Retirement age should be raised from 62 to 63 and the re-employment age raised from 67 to 68. And uh, the third thing, the first thing, of course, I said, giving effect uh, of the tropolite work group recommendations. Second, these two changes. The third one is actually uh, in the tropolite recommendation, uh, it also does flashes out uh, quite clearly that uh, we will raise our retirement age to 65 and re-employment age to 70 by 2030. So this will be in, a, in an incremental way uh, uh, with, amongst, uh, with, with discussions and negotiations between the tripartite partners. So, but this is the first step. Uh, uh, the remembrance on Tuesday is the first step uh, where we embark on this uh, raising of both retirement and re-employment age. And, uh, and uh, this, this, like I said, these are various ways where we can encourage those who are keen and able to work, to continue to work. Uh, at the same time, also uh, provide some avenue for employers to compensate um, workers uh, whom they are unable to re-employ for a variety of reasons, uh, if they have no vacancy, etc., uh, to be able to pay something called the Employment Assistance uh, Payment, uh, EAP for short. And this EAP amount uh, will be raised uh, again as well in, in July 2022. So I think the details are not out yet, but uh, it, it will be raised. I think the Minister Manpower has said it quite clearly on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. So I'll ask the question that everyone will ask, and this is what the grounds I hear when we when people say that the retirement age are uh, increased from 60 mm -hmm. uh, to 63. Mm -hmm. um, what does this mean actually for, for the employers, uh, for the employees, sorry? If I want to retire, am I mm -hmm. still entitled to retire or do I have to continue working until 63? Yeah, I, I think, I think well, the you can thing, retire. Yeah, you, <laughs> you can retire anytime you want, actually. If you are yeah. able to and yeah. you are you know, you're able to sustain yourself and uh, you're financially able to, like I said, uh, yeah. the law basically, um, you know, provides uh, uh, an avenue for those who are keen and able or sometimes maybe no choice have to continue to work to be able to do so. So if you want to retire early, please, uh, by all means do so. Uh, mm -hmm. Because I think there's, there's a grouse, you're right, you know, uh, when we, when we yeah. say raising retirement age and re-employment age, is, then you start seeing a bunch of angry uh, workers coming to us and say, yeah, are you telling me to re I, I already worked so hard for the last 42 years of my life. Are you asking me to continue? And the answer is no. Uh, if you are able to retire, please, uh, you know, um, by all means, retire. And uh, But if, if you need to can continue working and find ways to mm. be actively engaged in the workforce for a variety of reasons, some uh, usually want to keep their mind active and alert. Uh, mm. we, we, there, there are, uh, this, this changes to the act gives you the opportunity to do so. Mm. Yeah, so it's, it's merely, uh, well, not merely, but really the retirement and replant employment is to protect those people who have continued to work on after their, their past the retirement age. That's right. To ensure mm -hmm. that uh, I think they are not retrenched based on old age. Yes. Mm -hmm. right? So that they are offered. So if you are, if you are talking about being re-offered um, employment or contractual basis, um, what are some of the considerations for these older workers? Let's say when they are past retirement age, and they go into this contractual arrangement with their employers. What are some of the things that they should look out for? Yeah, if I may 
uh, I'll, I'll let we uh, Ben later, but maybe just yeah, a few, please, key, Patrick. few key areas would be, uh, uh, I'm, I'm a bit worried about this. So I spoke about it uh, on Monday. Uh, we we yes. stretched the, 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 the speeches all the way to Tuesday. We had many, many speakers. And I was a bit worried because uh, uh, there, there, may, there may be situations where employers uh, you know, have, have very unfair contract terms, uh, particularly because at the end of retirement age, it's a fresh contract altogether. A re-employment contract is usually a fresh contract. And, a, and, and the employer is given the prerogative to, to generate a fresh contract for the re-employed mm. worker. So that's where the... the the, the difficulty comes in. So that's why uh, in my speech, actually, uh, you know, speaking on behalf of all our workers, particularly the older workers, will be, you know, if you are getting your older worker or, or the re-employed worker to do the same job mm. at the same productivity level, at the same KPIs, please don't cut their salaries. Please don't cut their leave and benefits. Mm. Uh, it's only when you really are doing a smaller job, uh, like what's happened in many parts, uh, like in Japan, where we pick a leave mm. from. They actually do smaller jobs. They, they, they come down in the, from the hierarchy to, to mm. give to allow for leadership succession and renewal. So actually they do mm. a smaller job, maybe a mentoring job, maybe not five days a week, maybe three days a week. Then, then if you adjust the terms and the benefits, I think that's fair and that's responsible to do so. So actually my appeal out there is if, if the if this if the real employed worker is required to meet the same KPIs, mm. deliver the same targets at the same productivity levels, at the same speed and pace, then uh, there, there, there at least little room, you know, actually to, to try to reduce benefits for the sake of reducing and cutting costs. Mm. So I think probably related to this, given that, like as Patrick said, you're looking at a, a fresh contract. Um, I think one of the things for, for employees who are approaching um, the age, uh, do speak to your employer early and to start the conversation because... I mean, essentially, you need time to, to renegotiate this fresh employment contract. Um, I think it, that also gives, you know, I mean, you know, as with most things, you know, if you do it in a rush, chances are the outcome is going to be less satisfactory um, than what you or, or the employer expects. So um, in a way, if you have that conversation, perhaps for those who do have that option, you can consider whether or not you would prefer to just retire or you would actually prefer to con continue the re-employment. Um, it is also fair on the, for the employer that um, then they can also cater to their manpower needs to know whether or not you will be continuing to work for them. Um, I would also say, um, I think there also needs to be an element of um, perhaps being realistic as to uh, what is the scope of work uh, and duties that you'll be taking on uh, in, uh, when you're past 62, perhaps medically, uh, you, may, uh, you may not be as fit to do the exact same scope of work, then also, um, you know, there should be consideration that you'll be willing to scale down. But of course, um, provided that the employer is also reasonable in terms of, of the benefits that uh, are being given uh, to you as a re-employed worker. Um, so yes, yeah, so I think the practical advice would be to start the conversation early. Um, you know, it, 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 I, I think, you know, all the employers know that this is a mandated requirement. And I think they would be happy also uh, to, to broach the, the topic. Yeah, that's Maybe right. It, I mean, yeah. If I may add on to what uh, Wei Yi shared, uh, what I'm seeing on the ground with many of the companies, particularly the unionized companies, they are starting these conversations much, much earlier. Uh, not just uh, wait till you know, three months' time, but some even a couple of years beforehand, uh, two, three years before that, uh, to start the conversation early so that we can gradually assimilate uh, many of our older workers as they approach retirement age uh, to look at what the, the options, the opportunities, the internal redeployments, as well as uh, the job scopes and the leadership renewal and succession, etc. So actually they are uh, quite progress, I must say they are quite fair and as well as progressive practices uh, across Singapore. Some of these are available on the net. Uh, we have shared, shared many of these testimonies and uh, you know, uh, good stories about companies that have started this conversation, they even share some of their templates of what the things they discuss. And it's a very, very uh, concerted, a very, very uh, deliberate, and at the same time, also a very empathetic kind of uh, you know, it's a checklist going through, like what uh, they, they, they'll ask the, the employee, you know, what are your strengths, your weaknesses, and what areas do you hope to do post-retirement, uh, stuff like that. And then, you know, have, have that co critical conversation, so to speak, either through an internal uh, HR person or counsellor or mentor 
or coach. Uh, likewise, they also some companies, I know the bigger ones uh, are, are, you know, uh, are able to hire external coaches to help uh, this in this so-called uh, uh, retirement transition. So actually, these are some things uh, which I hope uh, employers out there who are tuning in will, will pick a leave from. At the same time, for you, who are you may be an older employee nearing a retirement age to have that critical conversation. That's very important. Maybe your bosses may not be as proactive or as progressive. So it's important you may you may want to start that critical conversation as early as possible. I mean, ideally is uh, you know one, two years in advance, but sometimes maybe not because of the, the looming uh, uncertain and uneven outlook. Maybe perhaps three or six months before retirement age can, can, could be a starting point to start having this conversation so that nobody is taken by surprise come your 62nd or next year, 63rd birthday. Yeah, it's a two-way conversation from what I hear from the two of you. Yes. Um, I thought I should also add a point because I do quite a bit of uh, work with the older um, um, uh, clientele as well. I think for them, for them, I always tell them, you need to start thinking about your retirement early because it's not just what kind of work you're going to be doing, but how are you going to retire if eventually? But some of them, they have worked, and, and for a lot of Singaporeans, I think they've spent their lives working, providing for their family, uh, doing what is necessary for their children, seeing them to university, etc., etc. Then when they reach a certain age, they go like, oh, it's time to retire, but I actually don't know what to do moving forward. Uh, so that conversation, talking to your employer, I thought uh, should also be an internal conversation with the employee himself or herself about how do they retire eventually. Uh, in terms of finding meaning in their lives in their golden years. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, I do have uh, some uh, questions about the uh, employment assistance payment. I know some of the things are not in, um, but can you just uh, maybe let us understand a little bit, Patrick, about this employment assistance payment? What is it meant to subsidize? How does yeah. it help the employer? Yeah, in employment assistance uh, payment uh, is usually uh, well a, a, a way to allow employers who, for example, unable to to uh, re-employ a worker, mostly due to internal vacancies or restructuring or reorganizing. Otherwise, if they are still a going concern, they are still doing the same thing. I think that there's no very little grounds for them to to not re-employ the worker. But however, there may be for some reasons there may be downsizing and whatever reasons. But because when you're past retirement age. Uh, usually there's no retrenchment benefits, uh, so to speak, uh, unlike, unlike when you are in, in normal course of employment. So therefore, this employment assistance payment is actually to pay out, uh, the in this case, for example, to, if you're talking about now, 62 to 67 is five years worth of uh, employment assistance payment. If it's a formula, it's going to be adjusted come next year, July. Um, basically, a, a small sum of money to help the, the employee yeah, to tie over the period where, and, until he or she let's say, decides to work and find some part-time work or other work uh, tied through that, 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 that difficult period. It's not a, 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 it's not a retention benefit. It's not a compensation of sorts, but it's sort of like an assistance payment. That's why it's called EAP, to, to help uh, the retired worker who is not re-employed to tie over that period uh, when, before he or she gets into uh, the next employment. Because sometimes it takes about, uh, as, as I don't know, it can be three to six months, sometimes even longer, so this provides some form of uh, sustenance for them. That, that, that's just, then that's, um, that, that clears up quite a bit of things. <laughs> yeah, because I thought we, we should clear up um, the, the concept of employment assistance payment. Uh, yeah, we, have right. a, yeah, we have a query from the attendee um, relating to the assistance uh, funds or the grants that you have mentioned. Hmm. Um, are they specific to certain sectors or do they cut across all industries? Or yes, there's actually United uh, Traineeships Program and Skills Program cut across almost practically all sectors. Basically, sectors, they, are, they have growth opportunities, they are looking for people. They've actually jumped on a bandwagon for the traineeship program. I know uh, some of the growth sectors like uh, the modern services sector, uh, well, they've taken in quite a lot of people. I think the one of the attendees uh, put put on uh, the the chat that you know uh, he or she is looking at social services sector. Yes, there is actually a uh, social services sector is hiring, and there are a whole plethora of schemes in the social services sector, including including professional conversion programs for you to undertake some skills training, sponsored, and of course uh, take up uh, some of these uh, as as long term opportunities in the sector. 
So you're right, social services sector is one of the sectors they are hiring. I think personal community and social services is another one of those growth sectors. I mean, particularly exacerbated by COVID-19. I think there are more need for people who are trained, uh, it, particularly the heartlands and the community to handle some of these social issues and challenges uh, because of COVID-19. Yeah, I, I know of some programs in the social service sector as well. I mean, there are some real programs where they encourage people from different industries to cross over to social, social service agencies as well. That's right. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I, I thought maybe we should address the query about jobs, uh, the jobs growth incentive that you mentioned, JGI. That yeah. also is not industry specific, right? Uh, yes, it's not industry specific, uh, but you need to apply for it. Lah i.e. The, the employer who is hiring you needs to apply for it. So you can't, you can't apply after you have uh, joined the company. So sorry, <laughs> Liang Shen, I know you are, you are talking about this, but, uh, but, but for those who are, who are hiring people or are going to be hired, uh, they have to apply for it. And uh, they, they, there are some conditions, terms and conditions. So check it out. I don't have it at the back of my head on my fingertips, but uh, just type job scope incentive in the Google and uh, it should lead you to most of the resources uh, on this, particularly for the Workforce Singapore um, uh, website. Okay. Since we're on the topic of resources, maybe it's time for me to move on to the next part since we are one hour into our uh, webinar. Um, and time passes really fast when I'm doing a webinar with Patrick and Wei. Um, okay, so so what we have done, yeah, yeah, what we have done is, uh, I mean, we have put together some resources. There's a QR code. Uh, for the attendees to scan and access these resources. They cover some of the things that we have talked about. For example, like the key employment terms, um, a template on TAFEP, uh, some of the MOM uh, advisories on retrenchment benefits, as well as the tripartite guidelines on re-employment of older uh, employees. Uh, what we have done in the uh, webinar today, I hope, was to give you a very brief overview of different categories of employees, talk about some of the things and the resources that are available so that, you know, as an attendee, you get to sort of uh, have an understanding or an insight on what are some of the things you can uh, look out for. Um, I'm sure if I may add, uh, I know some of you are watching it uh, via Facebook Live, either through the Law Society Pro Bono, Service, Pro Bono Services web page, or I, I've, I've also shared on my web page as well. So, uh, or should I say I've shared on my Facebook page as well. So, in case you are doing a watch party or doing this, uh, do scan a QR code and uh, do, do, a, do a screenshot. And then um, uh, like our Zoom participants tonight, you can also uh, access all this list of documents. But I know you can't click on the links, but you can scan a QR code and they're all available. I think these are some of the very, very useful, uh, very, very in instructive um, websites and links where you can get all the resources that we share. In fact, some of these things uh, we, we didn't, did not manage to cover, for example, like uh, the employment claims tribunals, flow charts, and how you do a mm -hmm. claim and, and or a tripartite alliance for dispute management. I thought these are all useful um, uh, resources where you can see how to file a claim. In, I, mean, touch wood, I mean, hopefully you don't have to get file a claim, but if you do, then uh, these are useful resources where you can, uh, which will guide you step by step um, um, to, to, to navigate, particularly if you have an employment issue. I, I maybe I'll touch a little bit on the employment claims tribunal and I really feel free to add on if you mm. want to. Um, employment claims tribunal has actually been simplified a lot for the employees to utilize. Uh, like, like what uh, Patrick has said, actually the website on the state courts actually gives a very good flow on what you should do. Um, and even the, the process, it involves mediation um, uh, facilitated by the um, organization as well, uh, TAFEP. Uh, if I'm not wrong, well, to help bridge the, the dispute between the employee and the employee. So that's something that I think the attendees, if they are, uh, you know, have some, run into some problems, they can look, that, look at that as well. Uh, but yeah, of course, yeah. there are some limits to the employment claims. Uh, again, uh, have a look at the website so you know, you know, you can't be possibly claiming for 100,000 of uh, mm -hmm. employment arrears, that kind of thing. Uh, there's a monetary limit. There's also a time period by which those claims uh, should be filed as Yes. Um, uh, yeah, I think particularly the time limit, you know, do check uh, the website because, um, you know, because the time limit, some, some of the time limits are not that long. So, I mean, it, it's, it's not, I mean, it's a silly reason, you know, that if because of that, um, then you are excluded from, from resolving the dispute uh, with the ECT. 
Uh, I think do note that lawyers are not allowed at the Employment Claims Tribunal. I think this is fair, is to equalize um, the positions of the employee and the employee. I mean, often the employee may, may be in a weaker uh, financial bargaining position. Um, so I think the idea is to equalize uh, the two parties. Um, I have... Uh, I, have had, I know of people who have brought claims at the ECT. Um, as the employees do know that um, the, the people who administer, uh, the, the officers who administer this process, um, they are very patient and they are very willing to guide uh, the claimants through the process. Uh, so don't be deterred. Uh, you know, if really there is a dispute, um, I think this is a very good avenue uh, for you to resolve it. And, and as uh, Lian Shen said, there's primarily uh, mediation first, you know, before you, you proceed to actually um, so-called push forward your claim. So, yeah, so don't, don't, don't be afraid to, to use this uh, avenue to yeah, resolve your disputes. If I may add, uh, since I'm from NTUC, the labor movement, uh, uh, do join us as union members because uh, if you're a union <laughs> member... We will walk that journey with you. Actually, I have a, a, a team of colleagues uh, in the Tropolite Alliance for Dispute Management, a team of NTUC colleagues who are helping our union members who may be a bit uh, you know, unsure about what to do next and uh, want to be able to navigate some of these. And uh, we have professional team of officers uh, to walk that journey with you if you are a union member. Yeah, and then to advise you what can be done, what cannot be done, how to do certain things. And of course, uh, if you're a union member and if you go into tripartite lines for dispute management and, and we, if we convene a tripartite panel, then your employment claims limits will also be expanded from 20,000 to a maximum of 30,000. So these are some of the benefits uh, mm -hmm. of being a union member, which I thought uh, we, we didn't cover in the resources, but I thought mm -hmm. uh, good to, to share with everyone, you know, do join, join us. Uh, and uh, as you know, I, I'm part, I head up the legal team. The legal team actually supports uh, uh, all these officers on the ground who are handling some of these uh, employment disputes. Mm. Actually, Liesha, there's this uh, query that I see uh, asking on the disadvantages of a contract of employment uh, versus a contract for employment. I suppose it's, you know, the I think the reference is actually probably to the, the employer-employee relationship, which is the contract uh, of service versus the independent contractor. I think one of the things is actually that um, unfortunately, if you come in as an independent contractor, um, the recourse to the Employment Claims Tribunal is, is not available uh, to you. So that's actually one of the... So since I thought we were on this topic of the ECT, yeah, yeah. I'll highlight that. Yeah, for, for freelancers or the gig workers, often their remedies lie in small claims. Yeah, the small yeah. claims tribunal. With the small claims tribunal. Uh, we will talk about that because we're going to go into QAA. Uh, soon, mm. but I thought I should tie up one question, which is a very important question from the attendee: is who can join the union? <laughs> yeah, anyone. Uh, oh, wow, it's nice to have uh, this question. Uh, essentially, any any person in an employment relationship can join the union. Yeah, but we 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 that's why our tagline: uh, every worker matters. So every worker now increasingly we have also uh, expanded our reach to freelance and self-employed workers as well. Because, uh, mind you, there are more than 200,000 uh, freelancers in Singapore. So uh, we are increasingly moving to that space. We can't uh, represent like a traditional union, but we actually do advocate on their behalf uh, with agencies, with uh, various industry groups uh, to, to push certain markers and to lobby certain areas. So yes, anyone. Uh, we, if we are student, you can't join. But however, we have a student membership. We call it the, the, the NIBO as well as the young NTUC. Uh, for, so for those of you who are fresh school leavers or still in school, either IT, Polytechnic, or even university or doing some external program, do connect with us by Nebo and uh, young NTUC because we actually do a lot of programs. Um, you just key in in the Google Nebo, N-E-B-O, uh, Nebo as well as uh, uh, young NTUC, you'll be able to see the whole plethora of programs that we do to help you to make sure you transit into the, or enter the workforce as smoothly and as successfully as possible. Um, and it's not just the employees because I think the employers themselves can also join a union if there are certain... Uh, oh, yes, yes. So, so uh, I, I mean, that, there'll be another legal primer, but, uh, <laughs> but essentially anyone can be a union member. Yeah, even the CEO can be. I mean, like many CEOs are, are union members. 
Mm -hmm. uh, it's only when it comes to representation, then uh, the CEO or certain excluded categories where there's conflict interest with collective bargaining can't be represented. But otherwise, everyone else uh, can be union members. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are many. Uh, we have we have talked about it before in our other webinars. Uh, national delivery champions. Um, I yeah, think the National are... Coaches Association. Um, there's the Creative Media um, Services Union. Yeah, those are for the freelancers. Yeah, yeah. So so feel free to uh, look at the websites. I think if you are looking at joining a union, there there are quite a bit of uh, information out there on those websites as well. Okay, yeah. um, I, I think we should move into the Q&A segment because there are quite a number mm -hmm. of questions coming in uh, and I, I do want to address them uh, as much as we can. Uh, let me deal with the golden uh, year employee question first. Okay, uh, because it's more of a practical thing which I thought it would, it would be nice uh, to hear from the panellists. Um, there's a question from an uh, attendee which, uh, which, which is asked, uh, what are the opportunities for those who have reached retirement age but still want to be re-employed and willing to be retrained. Where can they find opportunities? Uh, where are they available? Yeah, uh, that, that, I'll, I'll take that, Liang Shen. Mm. I, I think essentially, of course, we hope the company re-employs you. to continue uh, you come next year, July, up to 68. But however, if they can't and they give you an EAP, uh, we, we have actually uh, our Employment Employability Institute, NTUC E2I for short, as well as Workforce Singapore's Careers Connect. These two are the national uh, so-called job placement agencies uh, where you know, it's a one-stop uh, place where you can search out for some openings. Sometimes it may not be full-time openings. Sometimes it may be part-time openings or even gig openings uh, for, for you to take, uh, take on. Uh, like I said, uh, it may be in a variety of industries. So you need to really do a, a deep search. I know of companies who are looking for people. Well, well uh, the, the key thing is, Keep an open mind, have the right mindset. Uh, even if it's going to a new industry, give it a shot. You never know, you might like it. Uh, so so the, the key thing is uh, just go to these two national channels or one-stop services which are provided free of charge to, to every one of you. Just to repeat, that is uh, the E2I Institute you have workforce. Uh, uh, yeah, work, uh, E2I as well as the uh, WSG or Workforce Singapore's Careers Connect. So this one, you just, uh, is every, I think it's, uh, if I'm not wrong, is in our pocket series in my first job. Uh, the links are there. But otherwise, you just key in Workforce Singapore as well as or E2I. Uh, you should be able to, to navigate quickly into their platforms and virtual channels. Okay. Related to this category of employees, we also have another question. And then we feel free to join in. Mm. Um, it is a question relating to what are some of the good practices um, that would be that can be implemented so that the interests of senior employees are protected. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Well, I think the danger. I mean, based on the the question as asked, I think the danger is uh, for the senior employees, or rather, the fear is that you know, as they approach the the retirement age, maybe you know, the employees will find some excuse to to basically uh, terminate their employment. You know, to avoid the maybe the obligation to re-employ or to make payment. I mean, I mean, as the employee, I mean, this is a tough question in the sense that I mean, from the employee's perspective, you may do all you can to stay relevant, uh, to to make sure that in terms of your skill set and whatnot, you are current, you're upgraded, but it does not solve the problem that uh, you may have some average employers who nonetheless. Uh, you know, have these sort of bad practices where, where you know, they will just find an excuse to basically phase you out, you know, when you're, you're near the 62 or 63 age. I mean, unfortunately, what the law can do for you is that uh, you can have some recourse um, to, the, to, the, to the commissioner, to the minister. You can make certain representations. Um, and uh, I don't know if this is part of the resources, but um, I believe you can uh, basically, essentially, you can lodge um, a complaint in writing to the Commissioner for Labour um, and then so on. And there is a process that goes on after that. It also includes some form of mediation with the employer. Mm. Um, yeah, that, but, that's right. That's right, Wei. Yeah. Uh, so the, unfortunately, the, yeah. it's a bit limited. I mean, you know, the law steps in when, when the wrong has been committed so to speak. So I think this is um, unfortunately something that we, the law can't preempt, 
you know, I don't know, are there, but I suppose there must be some guidelines, you know, as to best practices on the employer's part on yeah. this. In fact, like, like I alluded to earlier, there's this tripartite recommendations mm. uh, report uh, on older workers. So there are a list of uh, recommendations inside there for employers to pick a leave from. But essentially, of course, there are two routes, the legal route and the practical considerations. I mean, the legal considerations, you have the RERA, uh, the Retirement and Reemployment Act, which, uh, which protects that 63, 68 come next year. Now it's 62, 67. So if, uh, if he or she is uh, not re-employed, he can file a case with uh, Ministry of Manpower. Uh, so that's one recourse. The other recourse, of course, uh, if it's still an employee, uh, let's say pre-62, um, meaning uh, he's not reached the retirement age, it could be a situation where uh, he can go under Section 14 of the Employment Act for unfair or unlawful dismissal, possibly. Mm. Yeah, and of course, access TADAM, uh, TADM, uh, Tripartite Alliance for Disputes Management as well as Employment Claims Tribunal. That's one route, the legal route. But practically, some of the good practices that uh, we have advocated is for companies to uh, build in. Uh, if, if, I, if for easy memory, or maybe some three piece meal, I call it. Uh, the first piece is to have the early conversation and counseling. Uh, to discuss what's next. I think that's important. Uh, the second one is very important is job redesign. Uh, the, the harsh reality is that in Singapore, we are having an aging workforce. An aging population as well as an aging workforce. And, uh, our, and we also have, to further exacerbate, we have a shrinking local workforce. Uh, much thanks to our, our, our low, low fertility <laughs> rates in Singapore. 1.14, uh, very dismal, one of the lowest in the world. So, so we actually have a very, very uh, tight labor market and, and every, every worker is important. That's why we, you know, the tagline, every worker matters. So I think it's very, it's key to every employer because you still need certain jobs, you still need certain workers uh, to, to redesign your workplace. Uh, even if using uh, a, a tablet, you start seeing a lot of digitalization. If they are properly trained, they are equipped to, they can perform as well, if not better than uh, some of the younger ones. And, and, and of course, third is... Uh, in, in terms of salary, emoluments, remuneration, etc., I think pay by competency. I think increasingly we, we, are, we are advocating this. Uh, you don't, you, you know, you don't, you don't uh, just because the person with nearing retirement age, uh, you pay what is fair to, to, to him I mean, in that case. If it's delivering these targets it's at this level of productivity, I think it, it continues to be at that. Uh, that shouldn't change. I think that's, that's very, very important. You, you hire and pay by competencies. Yeah. I think also maybe related um, is what we talked about earlier, which is to have that conversation with your employer, which is, you know, like as a person reaching maybe 62 or 63, do you expect to be able to work at the same, are you prepared to work at that same level, at that same pace? You know, I mean, sometimes there, be a, there may be an erroneous assumption on the employer's part that, you know, you may want to scale it down a little bit, you know, whatnot. But, you know, if, if I mean, if you're able to, you know, and if that's something that you want to do, you want to continue at that same uh, level, you know, perhaps have the conversation with your employer and, and the employer may be well happy to keep an experienced employee uh, around rather than to redeploy you or scale you down and have to have somebody else take over your, your job scope, you see. So sometimes it's a mismatch of the assumptions. Yeah, and, and, and really, you know, it's, sometimes it's beyond the tripartite partners, the government, the employers, and, and of course the unions uh, and NTUC. I think it's very important. Society plays a very important role in being more embracing, uh, well, to a certain extent, a bit more tolerant and a more accepting uh, of older workers in various places. Could be in the F&B outlet, it could be a retail mall, supermarket. I think, I think this... This whole societal approach is very, very important and crucial to ensure that uh, we can we can you know carry on and keep this uh, senior worker agenda flag flying high. Yeah. And I do see some of that happening as well. I think like like what Wei was saying, you know, when 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 I when I look at some of my cases that come in and they talk about um, uh, working with the older employee, uh, employees, they also talk about whether there can be a consultancy role, for example, for the older employees. Men uh, mentor of, roles. Huh? Yeah, mentor roles. Mm. Uh, I've also heard of successful cases where some of the older employees find um, uh, work as a job coach, mm. right, to mentor younger people or to go into other companies and then try to uh, ensure 
that the work conditions are right so that they offer their experience. And I think a lot of, for example, HR people who are of a certain level, they're able to offer that kind of advice, mm -hmm. um, job coaching, uh, going into companies and set things right. Um, some of these HR people, I've also heard gone into social service agencies to do job coaching, right, to help mm -hmm. um, allow for companies to accept um, the the uh, employees with uh, you know uh, uh, special conditions, you know, to allow for the environment to uh, accept them and then facilitate that kind of um, employment of uh, uh, employees with special needs, etc. So, so some of the older workers I've seen some success stories as well, like, and, and I thought that was uh, something I wanted to share. Yeah. I now, actually, I saw some of the questions coming. I thought I also want to try <laughs> attempt to answer them. Okay. Uh, one on I I, I saw quite quickly uh, on uh, are there are there upcoming changes to help delivery personnel and private hire drivers? <laughs> and earlier on, you alluded to the associations, right? Uh, so so yes, we have formed the uh, National Private Hire Vehicle Association in light of previously Uber and now Grab, Gojek, and Tada. So, so we have actually formed this association uh, under the auspices of the labor movement, NTUC, and we have been working very closely and many of them now are our members. Uh, we have a great uh, committee looking at this and, and uh, looking at the various issues concerning them. Uh, you know, a, a very, uh, as well as the uh, delivery personnel. So we just, yeah, just uh, slightly less than a year ago formed the national uh, delivery champions. Uh, and, and really, uh, in case you're not aware, just last month, it's been announced by Ministry of Manpower. Uh, Senior Minister of State, Kopo Kun, has uh, formed a, not a tripartite work group, but a work group, uh, because uh, uh, as these are independent contractors, there's technically no employer. So there's a work group of mm. people, including some of our representatives from our labour movement who are in there. We are discussing and, uh, and getting a sense of the ground to see what are the issues that uh, commonly come up. Uh, affecting them very close to the hearts. For example, like what if you get a work injury? What about my retirement? My, I don't have retirement savings, but I'm an independent contractor. Or, or, or even things like, you know, uh, are these platform companies paying me uh, uh, you know, ethically, you know, uh, in that mm -hmm. sense, uh, with all the algorithms, I don't even know why sometimes I assign certain jobs uh, and why my buddy next to me is not assigned a job. So things like that, uh, they are looking at it and uh, they will come out with the deck recommendations and maybe if need to change some policies, come out with some programs or even pass some laws to, to address some of these. So that's a, a, a long answer to that question. Uh, I think freelancer rights have developed quite a bit in the last couple of years. Uh, it's been something that we've always been talking about, even with Law Society Pro Bono Services Office. We do quite a number of talks about it. Um, which also brings me to the first, one of the earlier questions we had uh, where we alluded to actually what are the disadvantages between being a freelancer and being a, in a contract of employment as an employee. Mm. Uh, we would just like to help, uh, you know, elaborate a little bit on what are the disadvantages other, other than, of course, you know, not being able to go to employment claim tribunal. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, that's, you know, that's when something crops up. Um, well, I think, uh, as I also did briefly mention, uh, I think the question is that as an independent contractor, uh, you know, the, the statutory entitlements that uh, you see contained in the Employment Act um, technically don't apply to you as an independent contractor. Um, so in that sense, like, you know, the, the safety net is not there. Everything is contained in uh, your contract. So, which makes it uh, very important for, for you to uh, understand, you know, uh, the contract that you're signing very well. So, I mean, for, for uh, the ladies, for the women, um, important things like maternity leave, uh, childcare leave, you know, these are also not uh, technically mm, safeguarded uh, by the Employment Act that uh, if you're an independent contractor. Um, but I mean, I suppose the thing is that if you are a person who's quite savvy, uh, in, you know, you have done this for a long time, you know, and you understand what's in the market and whatnot, if you have the ability, you can actually, and of course, if you are in a position to negotiate, you can actually uh, negotiate with your employer to ensure that um, all these, uh, uh, I would say, entitlements that are commonly found in the market are contained in your contract. So it's, there is a way to, to overcome it, 
you know, but I think that the important thing though is then to know, to understand very clearly, you know, what is the market practice for, for these sort of things. Yeah. yeah. I think in some of the freelancer talks, we also say, how do you price yourself, right? As a freelancer, when you price yourself, do you take into account all these uh, entitlements that you're giving up? And then, you know, for example, you, you don't have CPF contribution, then when you price yourself for the services that uh, you are giving, uh, do you factor that in into the quote that you're giving your client as well? I think that's all, these are also important considerations for, mm. for the freelancers. Yes, um, but I suppose the thing about the freelancer, there are some benefits, I mean, in the sense that you are not, most of the time, you may not be strictly tied to the employer. So in terms of, um, your earnings, you know, you, are, you know, you do have the opportunity to seek out, you know, other earning opportunities um, in the course of your work with this particular entity. So, I mean, there are also some advantages, but I think the key thing is that you, you need to be quite aware in order to ensure that you are uh, well protected. So do, do, if this is your first time doing it, please go and read up on all the materials that, that uh, you know, we have referred to. Yeah. There was one question I saw, uh, Yangshen, asking about retrenchment benefits because uh, when company close shop and uh, offshores the, the, the out of Singapore or maybe you know has, has to uh, make your job redundant I think the key test to that is uh, redundancy if there's a redundancy there's usually a payment of retrenchment benefits that's why I ask everyone to join the union because if you're <laughs> part of the union and there's a collective agreement uh, usually the retrenchment benefit is stated quite clearly and negotiated uh, in, in, uh, via the collective agreement and with the union. So that's one route. The other one is, of course, if you have, uh, like what maybe you mentioned, you have a very clearly outlined employment contract, then uh, some of these, uh, well, some call it sort of benefits, some like to use better terms like severance payments or mm. other form of uh, payments. Uh, that, that is usually entrenched in the employment contract. That's why I asked you to read it front to back, word for word. Because it may in, some, in most large organizations, it's usually quite well entrenched inside. So read the fine print. And, and finally, if, if, uh, if uh, the company does not pay you a single cent, unfortunately, the Employment Act, uh, in, in uh, Part 4 of the Employment Act, uh, talking about retention benefits, does not really state uh, uh, very, very clearly, does not state very, very clearly, uh, whether retention benefits are compulsory to be paid to employees. It says it in a ne negative eligibility way. So may, may, may pay retirement benefits if you have at least two years service. So, so that is, it's not by law. However, however, uh, there's uh, uh, some tripartite advisories on this and guidelines on this. Uh, and, and if you feel that aggrieved, if you're not, if you're working like 30 years and never paid a single cent, like I said, um, if you have the union, we can help you. Uh, the TADAM team can help you. At, uh, TADAM, NTUC at TADAM team can help you. Otherwise, you can also file a claim at TADAM to try lah, to mediate over this. Yeah. And uh, generally, I think if uh, the employer is thinking of retrenchment, they also should notify MOM as well. Oh, that's right. Yeah, there's a retrenchment yeah. notification requirement. So take note of that. Okay. Yes. So that covers uh, almost uh, most of the questions that we have been put to. Um, I've been told that I'm left with about two minutes. So I thought it's important for me to wrap up this webinar by inviting each of our panelists uh, to share with us one key um, takeaway that they want the attendees to have um, uh, after seeing this webinar. Mm. We? <laughs> okay. Ladies first, I'll make it quick since we only have two minutes. I think flexibility. Flexibility is key in the current climate. Um, flexibility in terms of uh, what you expect for yourself. Flexibility in terms of your relationship with your employer. Uh, uh, I, think, I think the flexibility will add, enable you know, us to survive this uh, transition from pandemic to endemic. For me, uh, very easy. Uh, you're not alone. Uh, you never walk alone. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, we, there, are, there are various resources that are available, and uh, and really, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of support structures there, labor movement unions, and and of course the various resources that you see. Uh, we have a plethora of resources and help and support for you at the community, etc., including our free legal clinics, not just at the Law Works Legal Clinic, but also uh, Law Sock Pre PBSO also. Uh, runs uh, community legal clinics which you can access to 
uh, to find out more, if you really, you know, at your wit's end and need more information and need some help and a helping hand, uh, I can't emphasize more, you're not alone. There are a lot of resources, a lot of help available. Just seek out those. Many of them are available today in the resource page. Uh, many of them are also available on the Law Society Pro Bono Services uh, Office uh, website. Right? Uh, Patrick alluded to the community legal clinics. Um, uh, they are also at the various CDCs. So there are five CDCs. Um, uh, there are one every week for each CDC. Um, and you can just register for the pro bono legal clinics. I think that's a chat um, that has been placed in the chat to everyone. So if you do require some form of legal advice, uh, it's pro bono, meaning it's free, you need to register. And then you will have a lawyer who will give you about a 20 minute to 30 minute um, consultation session to address your queries. Okay, so that's uh, the information that's there. All right. Um, I've also been reminded that actually for the freelancer uh, matters, uh, some of the collaterals are also on the OSPBSO website. And I think uh, NTUC has also helped us with uh, some of the collaterals as well. Mm. Yeah. Um, also for arts practitioners, there's also Advocates for the Arts, which is a publication dedicated to arts practitioners, as well as those in the creative, media and design industry. So if you, and, and they, that talks quite a bit about what is a contract for employment, contract of employment, et cetera. Okay, so with, with that, um, I've been chased. We are over time. I'm afraid I have to bring this webinar to a close. Uh, thank you, Patrick and Wei Yi, so much for the sharing. Um, as I always say, we have so much to cover in 90 minutes, and I'm, and I'm very grateful because I always learn a lot of new things, uh, especially from Patrick. Yeah, me too. <laughs> 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 so, so for our attendees, um, please scan the QR code, uh, visit our website, cdc.gov.sg slash law awareness weeks with the S uh, to find out more about the other webinars that are organized under the law awareness weeks. So it is a, um, a, a sort of a, a campaign that we have where there are many different kinds of uh, talks organized to address different areas of uh, law that you might be interested in. Okay, um, the theme for our law awareness week weeks relates to relationships. I think relationships are precious, uh, like what we say, be flexible. Uh, if you're able to hear relationships between those around you, including with your employer, dealing with them um, in a more uh, peaceful and uh, um, manner, uh, that is helpful as well. All right. Uh, so with this webinar, uh, after it ends, there will also be a feedback form sent to you, the attendees, uh, for you to uh, complete. Uh, right now on the screen, you'll also see a QR code. You can scan that in and uh, we would really appreciate if you just help us complete the form so that we can improve our webinars in the future. Okay, and with that, uh, last thanks to Patrick and Wei for sharing your information and knowledge with us. And uh, thank you to the participants for joining us today. And I hope everyone have a pleasant weekend ahead. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Yangshan. Okay, bye.